Amen. So like this morning, I do want to do some revision. A sister asked a question about 10 days ago that related to the Sunday law. And I answered it last week, but I want to go over that point again uh, as we head into Millerite history so that we have a, a firm foundation, firm platform to begin with. There will be a short question and answer session after this presentation. Just to notify you, it will be, uh, and here on in, they will be recorded and uploaded. So just so everyone's aware, if, if they want to speak, they're welcome to speak. But those, their questions uh, will be recorded and uploaded. Can everyone hear me okay? Sister Marie's having some problems. So there will be, they will be recorded and uploaded. It will just be a short question and answer session. And if you wish to put your questions in the chat box, that would be helpful. But I know that people um, can share quotes and uh, share in there through the presentation. So I'm sorry if I lose track of your questions, um, but please also put them in, in that question chat box if it's suitable. I haven't yet um, figured out how to make a particular separate question and answer box as Elder Tabo did for the Ca uh, Canada Zoom meeting. Uh, we might be able to do that next week. So there was a question that I was asked recently that I only want to spend a couple of minutes on uh, because it's one that people continue to uh, bring forward. And the question is, uh, I've answered it in presentations before, it's not a new question, but I just wanted to bring in an element that I haven't spoken of much and people may have forgotten. They, the question was, how did the study of the King of the North and the King of the South bring us to the subject of equality? So this subject, this question has been raised before and it was answered um, particularly in the Ugandan, uh, Northern Ugandan camp meeting uh, earlier this year, a few months ago. What we did at that camp meeting was build upon a previous study from December. We have our reform line, our five key way marks, our four dispensations, and we identify that in every dispensation, the ploughing, the early rain, the latter rain, the harvest, there is an increase of knowledge and a formalisation. In December 2018, that study was titled Boston Concord Exeter. Four dispensations, a testing, specific testing message for each one of those dispensations. The message starts innocently enough. For instance, here people can answer in the chat if they wish to challenge themselves uh, to, to remember these things. It started off as line upon line, developed into Daniel 11 verse 40, which gave us 1989. So reform lines were the first, first thing given to this movement was reform lines. Everything else is built upon that one core subject. This developed into Daniel 11 verse 40, our understanding of that, which gave us 1989. which was discussed in this morning's presentation. 
Early rain dispensation for the priests. The increase of knowledge was the 2520. Innocent enough. However people fight against it, all that study teaches in, it, in what it was core understood from 2000 and the, the early mid 2000s, mid late 2000s, was that the 2520 is a time prophecy understood by William Miller that brings you to 1798 and 1844. Innocent enough, time prophecy fulfilled um, 160, 80 years ago depending which one you mark. Uh, Sister Catherine spoke about that last week and she's building that study. But we kn know that in 2012 it developed into time setting. Now that message is a challenging testing message. Now we're into the history of the latter rain. The latter rain message began with the subject of the king of the north and the king of the south. in 2016 that increase of knowledge but it developed by two years later into the subject of equality so what the person is asking is how did this increase of knowledge get to this formalization how did the subject of the king of the north and the king of the south develop into our understanding of equality, racism, sexism, homophobia. So I don't want to go into the full study of Eden to Eden. For much of these studies, and I've tried to demonstrate it, particularly in what was taught from 2018-2019, uh, was that these studies Each step of that process came with about two witnesses. So there was two witnesses that would take us to uh, World War II, two witnesses to take us to World War I, uh, for example. There's really two witnesses that, sh that brought us to equality. One is the subject of dispensationalism, Eden to Eden, uh, New Earth to New Earth. The, the sin um, that led to racism, um, which is described as a curse, not that God instilled it in humanity, but was a result of human sin, and then the removal of that curse from God's people. Uh, a sin led to sexism. It's described as a curse placed on Eve. Again, this was not the will of God. It's the consequence of sin, and then... God, through each reformatory dispensation, removes that from his people. And it takes a process of 6,000 years to bring his people to where they are today. Not that we have necessarily arrived in each individual life, but where the message stands on equality. So I want to put that Eden to Eden study to one side and just in a few minutes cover that subject. Uh, the, the first way that it turned from King of the North, King of the South to equality. Can the camera see down here? Or is the laptop blocking? Down all across. Okay. I want to open up a dispensation. This is the, the reform line of the priests. I want to step back and go to the reform line of the 144,000. This is the early reign for the 144,000, our current dispensation, 9-11 to the Sunday law. As I've stated before, 
where in the increase of knowledge, past the increase of knowledge of the Sunday law, which is why we had the uh, opening up of truth that we experienced last year. We had this increase of knowledge. We're heading towards the formalization, all of which will bring us to the test. We could understand this in a, using different symbols and say Boston, Concord, Exeter, test, October 22. That pattern from Millerite history. So what opened up this subject of equality this testing message was the increase of knowledge on the King of the North and the King of the South, but specifically the King of the South. Acts 27 took us to the history of Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus is the King of the South. Almost every study done to date on the wars between the King of the North and the King of the South up until 2018, they almost entirely focused the perspective from the King of the North. It was all about the king of the north and this fight he had with this other kingdom in the south. But we always shone the, to the torchlight most closely on the king of the north because it was the king of the north that we particularly understood through Bible prophecy. We understood it as the, um, when going into Revelation, seeing the woman riding the beast, all of that symbology. And we understood it to be a church-state relationship. The King of the North, a church and state relationship. So the way that we came to understand that was through understanding that the King of the North and the King of the South are polar opposites. And you, we went into the model of geography. We talked about the North Pole and the South Pole, how they are identical in some respects and opposite in others. In other words, we did a compare and a contrast, all of which is, is, fits really well with the model of geography and the North Pole and the South Pole. We went into um, a look at history into Ptolemy's Egypt and the church-state relationship he had compared to the church-state relationship in Babylon, compared them, contrasted them. The comparison was they're both in church-state relationships. The contrast is, is that in the King of the South, the church does not control the state, the state controls the church. So if I can make a modern day application, Trump came to power and then he, how, how did he come to power? Who gave him power? The evangelicals in the United States gave power to Donald Trump. So you have the church giving power to the state. How does it work in Vladimir Putin's Russia? The same way it worked in Ptolemy's Egypt, the same way it worked in the French Revolution, the same way it worked in Stalin's Soviet Union. Vladimir Putin comes to power and he gives some authority to who? The church, because he can use the church to his own end. So the king of the north, the state, has the power. They permit the church to have some power. Sorry, other way around. In the king of the north, this, the state comes to power, but it is given its power by the church. In the King of the South, the state comes to power, but Vladimir Putin was not elected. He does not receive his power from the Russian Orthodox Church. Instead, he permits them to have some authority and then uses them for his own political ends, inside and outside of Russia. So the way that the subject of the King of the North and the King of the South, the Diadochi Wars, uh, the World Wars, Pyrrhus, the way they took us to the subject of equality is because they opened up, shone a spotlight on the nature of the King of the South. 
I just want to add one element um, to that, which I think is, is not, it's not the evidence in itself. This is the model. Eden to Eden is the model. But there, I, I do like this prophetic time span. When you consider that 2019 is the, the opening up of this subject of equality to, to its uh, fullest extent, And it's 220 years from 1799. 220, what does that number represent in Bible prophecy? It represents a restoration, yes. The, 20, the, the 220 represents restoration in inspiration. So we have a number marking restoration that brings us to the restoration of um, equality, uh, of um, the end of nationalism, the end of sexism. So what does this 220 restoration bring us back to? In 1799, where is Napoleon? 1798, he goes to Egypt, he wages war with Egypt in the south and Turkey in the north. But when he goes to Egypt, he brings a team of scientists with him. And in 1799, what do those scientists discover? In Rosetta. They discover the Rosetta Stone. What does the Rosetta Stone enable people to do for the first time in history? It enables them to unlock the language of Egypt, to unlock the hieroglyphics. When they find that Rosetta Stone, the way it's written in multiple languages helps them to decode hieroglyphics. So in 1799, they're given the keys to understanding the language of Egypt. 220 years later, what we unlock is the nature of Egypt. This is the 220 of restoration. It takes us from unlocking the language of Egypt in 1799 to unlocking the nature of Egypt in 2019. Egypt in both histories can be marked as the king of the south. That's the 220 of restoration. We discussed without going into details the model of the polar opposites. And we touched on but did not study the history of dispensations. Eden to Eden. So I just wanted to answer that question uh, from someone who asked to understand how this increase of knowledge developed into this formalization in that history. And it was this model that came first, understanding the polar opposites. It was later that the, that the other evidences um, were added on, on top of this first witness. So I'll put that to, I'm going to rub this off if you don't mind. Um, someone just wishes to take a photo. I'll rub this off in a moment and we'll come back to what, we, what we've been working through last week. I, I began last week with a, um, with a review. So I got in trouble. Someone said that I'd forgotten my trip to Tahiti in December. But I had not. I promised that I had not. I was focusing on the end of December when in Australia we started discussing uh, particularly the uh, fulfillments of 2019 and what happened in the spheres of influence uh, that the King of the North and the King of the South were fighting over in that year, but also in that whole dispensation, 14 to 19, those uh, prophetic bookends. So that's why I didn't mention Tahiti. I was speaking about the last presentations done in Australia just before the journey to Kenya, uh, then through to Uganda, through to South Sudan, 
um, through to Brazil, Portugal, and then back to Australia. And the reason I stepped through that history is because I wanted to remind us what, we've, what message we've kind of been um, building upon. There was explanation of 2019, but then particularly in Uganda, we turned our attention to the end of ancient Israel. So what I particularly brought, wanted to, us to discuss in Uganda was our close of probation way mark how it is symbolized by the cross at the end of ancient Israel and how you can look at the history either side of this way mark by identifying Gethsemane and the wilderness from the two reform lines we build from that history. So we can see Gethsemane and we can see the wilderness. Two crises that Ellen White describes in almost identical language, the two times Christ fought Satan directly and where if he failed or fell, the entire hope for humanity was lost. So you can compare and contrast Christ's experience in Gethsemane with his experience in the wilderness in that 40 days. It happens straight after this waymark, also symbolized by the baptism. So either side of this waymark is a point of crisis, two separate crises back to back. The reason that I, I started discussing the end of ancient Israel is because we were here. And if anyone felt relaxed once the shaking was over, uh, to, with Future for America to, to that extent, they needed to see that we were not out of danger. In fact, we were into a whole new danger. A danger that we're still currently in and confronting. So that is why we went to the, to the reform line of the end of ancient Israel. I don't want to redraw that reform line. We have done that um, quite a number of times and it, and it takes time. What I would like to do is just for revision, just to do in uh, a very short space, is to share my screen. And I hope people can, can see this. This is the black, if you can differentiate between the black and the red. Uh, I recognize that if, if someone is a little color blind, they, they will struggle. But the black is directly labeling the way marks. And that is the end of, end of modern Israel. So this is the end of modern Israel. Up above the end of modern Israel, we've placed the end of ancient Israel. And this is what we particularly labored over in the early months of this year to become established in the minds of the movement. Identifying that their time of the end was 4 BC with the birth of John the Baptist and then Christ, that this first ploughing occurred under the ministration of John the Baptist, the first angel. Christ is baptised, the arrival of the second angel you have the work of Christ to prepare a group of teachers who will be equipped to give the, the message of the gospel. 
not directly to the world, but back to the church. So first of all, one group is called the disciples. They're trained first under John, then uh, in this time period between the baptism and the first temple cleansing, they should learn in this dispensation to move their allegiance from John the Baptist to Christ. This causes some problems within the disciples that Christ must battle with throughout this history. Then in the history of the latter reign, this is the ministration of Christ between the first temple cleansing and the cross. The cross begins the time of trouble for the disciples. It was their close of probation. They go through their harvest time period. The last polishing efforts are made for their training. And then at Pentecost, they go not to the Gentiles, but back to the church. And between Pentecost and 34 AD, there is a second call made to ancient Israel. 34 AD is the end of the 490 years and the gospel moves its focus from being directed solely at the Jewish nation to now being directed towards the Gentiles. And from 34 AD to 70 AD, the gospel goes to the Gentiles, to the world. 70 AD marks that close of probation. You have John the Revelator. He's one of the original disciples who was trained under Christ. And in this history, after 70 AD, you have a death decree. They attempt to kill him, but they can't. He's banished to the island of Patmos. And Ellen White says he here witnesses the second advent of Christ. So you have the full model of the end of ancient Israel as it confirms the end of modern Israel, that we have a calling, a time of the end begin in 1989. You have the work of Elder Jeff Pippinger. You have the training of the, this first group of, of uh, we call them the priests because of Ezra, when it speaks about the priests, Levites and Nethanims. It's speaking about the three groups that left Babylon in the history of that um, gathering time period. So there were the priests and the Levites, two calls for uh, those of the Jewish nation to leave Babylon and then for the Nethanims for the world. And we know that we go to the world with the gospel at the Sunday law, the Sunday law lining up with 34 AD. So we have two calls for the church, one call for the Gentiles, for the world, priests, Levites, Nethanims. You can see that through um, their calling out of Babylon, the idolatry of Babylon, and here they're being called out of the idolatry of Rome, which we discussed what that looks like when we spoke of the Apis bull and um, that subject that we've been discussing over the last couple of months. So I wanted us just to see that and have that in, in our minds. I'd encourage everyone to draw it for themselves um, where possible. Now I'll just try and unshare my screen. I don't know how to do that. Stop share. Okay. So we're back. Someone screenshot. That's, 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 that's a blessing. God bless for our tech savvy brethren. Our sister Debbie says thank you. Um, yes, I'm not one of them, so I'm more than grateful. So I just wanted us to have that in our minds. That was our focus over the last schools and camp meetings, um, that, that was my focus because I want people to see where we are on that reform line and how we essentially go from the pot into the fire, if you can call it, put it that way. That whatever shaking and trouble we faced last, in the, towards the end of the last dispensation with social conservatism, we face at the beginning of this dispensation with moral liberalism and it's typified in that history by the experience of Gethsemane and then the temptations in the wilderness. Two 
time periods where there is a great test placed upon the movement. That has been covered in some detail. I'm not saying that it won't be covered again, taught again, it will. But what we have done since then is move from the history of the end of ancient Israel into the history of the beginning of the modern. And I've discussed that before. That God is opening up these reform lines in order. The reform lines given to us in 1989. Ancient, modern. Our focus was on this one. It's the Omega of ancient. It's a history of success. It make, gives us this model, gives us the model of the three groups called and then the 144,000, the Omega of modern. History of success, history of success. What we've turned our attention to since, being, um, since these meetings back in Australia is this history. Because for modern Israel, the end is typified by the beginning and we need to continue to move forward into an understanding of the Alpha of, of modern Israel, the Millerite time period, 1798, where Adventism began. How Adventism began will explain to us how Adventism ends, making note for the difference between a history of success and a history of failure. So in, in discussing this history, it becomes very important then for us to understand in the, why that actually is a reform line to begin with. And to understand that it's a history of failure, what are you saying when you say it's a history of failure? What you're essentially saying is something was meant to happen and it failed to happen. And what failed to happen was the second advent of Christ, that he was to come back in the Millerite time period, but he didn't because of the failure of his own people. So the question that my sister asked, how do you know he was meant to come back in that history, is, act is absolutely crucial to understanding that this is, this is an alpha history, that it is a reform line and that it can typify the end, but also to understand the difference between failure and success, to understand that it was a history of failure in the first place. So again, this is another subject we, we have gone over before, but it still has, um, people still have questions in their mind and I don't intend to do a full presentation upon it, but I do want us to revise what we have understood before. So in this presentation, there's a lot of revision and I can already see I, I might uh, run out of time before too long. So there's a lot of revision to build upon um, a, a more thorough look at Millerite history. So I want to screen share once again. What I did last week was go through some quotes. So I might write those quotes on the board before I, I screen share. I'll just rewrite the quotes on the board that uh, I will reference while we're, on, uh, while we're looking at that um, paper. Life sketches 80. Three, two, one uh, paragraphs, particularly paragraphs one and paragraph three. Early writings 275.2. Evangelism 694.2. To just give some dates with these, 
Life sketch is 80. This, um, what was written here, was written in, it is speaking of her experience in 1856. So that's 1856, early writings, this is a, a passage in Spiritual Gifts that was published in 1858. So we're talking early. Evangelism 694.2, this was from 1868. Evangelism 694.3. Now we're going into later history. This was 1900. That's 44 years from our first quote. We're, we're going into a different time period. Point three and four. And then great controversy. We know the dates for that 1884, 88, 1911 version. Uh, great controversy 573.1. Uh, I should have put them back to back, actually. And keep that order. So I will screen share now. What we didn't do last week is go through the two publications that we have. What we do is we line up early writings with the Great Controversy. Early writings was written in 1858. It is the original manuscript where she takes God's people from the beginning of the Great Controversy through to the final end, the end of the thousand years. So in early writings, she gives the same overarching view of world history that she gives in the Great Controversy, but she does it 30 years earlier. And what we want to do is compare and contrast the similarities and the differences. So we've already made the claim that Christ was to return in the 1860s. 1863 can be marked through the 2520. And I'll refer us back to the quotes on the board. Two years before she publishes early writings, she's at a conference at Battle Creek. It's May of 1856, two years prior to the date of the publishing of Spiritual Gifts. She says, at the conference, a very solemn vision was given me. I saw that some of those present would die. Some would be subjects. Some would experience the seven last plagues and some would be translated to heaven at the second coming of Christ without seeing death. So it's two years before the publishing of this spiritual gifts uh, that you find in early writings, that publication, and she's visiting people and she's given a vision. And it's not just she's told that some of those people would witness the second advent without seeing death. She's also told that some would be alive through the history of the seven last plagues. In other words, the seven plagues and the second advent was to occur within the lifetime of those living in 1856. In the next few paragraphs, it talks about one who was there who recognized she was one of the ones who was going to die and she died the following Friday. So she was going to die. She had a, a tumour uh, that ruptured internally. She was quite ill. But some of those there were to experience the seven plagues, 
were to witness the second advent uh, without seeing death. So the context of that is it's written in 1856 in a time period where Ellen White is preparing people for the imminent in their lifetime return of Christ. Early writings is a document, uh, spiritual gifts, I should say, um, published in early writings, is a document that is tailored for those people, for that hoped for plan for the end of the world, where Christ would have turned, returned in their lifetime. That's how we approach spiritual gifts. What we've done is compared and contrast that model where Christ was to return then with great controversy. A new publication in 1888 written for a new hoped for model at the end of the world. This is the triple application of Bible prophecy. Two histories of failure co combined show us our own history of success. Millerite history, 1888 history combined to show the history of the 144,000. Christ should have returned in the Millerite history. That becomes clear, not just from the quote of 1856 and her vision at that conference, but from the entire structure of spiritual gifts that was written to prepare people. When that fails, she says in 1868, that was our third quote, She says that the morning, the second advent of Christ, what she's referring to, has been deferred in mercy. God's willingness to have his people perish has been the reason for so long a delay. What she's saying here is that Christ was to return, but his second advent has been deferred. It has been delayed. She's saying that in 1868. So 1856, she says he will return in the lifetime of those here present. Then in 1858, she writes that she publishes spiritual gifts, which would have been the document for those people. In 1868, she's already said that that plan has been delayed. So there's a failure of God's people in this history that delayed the plan for the second advent. It gets passed on to a second hoped for history. That is 1888. Great controversy is written, tailored for them. And we have here lined up the, the chapter titles in Spiritual Gifts with the chapter titles found in the Great Controversy. You find William Miller in Spiritual Gifts is an American reformer in the Great Controversy. She's covering the same history. And what she's going to do is cover the history from 1798 to the deliverance of the saints or God's people delivered the second advent. So these chapters are 1798 to the second advent. And you can see how they're both tailored for the hoped for second advent of Christ in the lifetimes of those living. First of all, the lifetimes of those living in the 1850s, then the lifetime of those still living in the 1880s and 90s, both histories being a history of failure. This model shows you what that reform line should have looked like if it was successful. 1798, William Miller, an American reformer, covers the history of 1798 to 1844. Post 1844 begins to be discussed with, in Spiritual Gifts, the chapter Spiritualism and Covetousness the introduction of Laodiceanism to the early Adventists, as well as the external spiritualism in the world. It is the parallel for the great controversy chapter, Can Our Dead Speak to Us? Discussing Spiritualism. This is post-1844. So we can skip straight from here, this is post-1844, to the chapter, The Loud Cry, The Final Warning. The Final Warning is the loud cry. They are parallel chapters. Then Spiritual Gifts gives us the chapter of the close of probation, the third angel's message closed. 
They both discuss the time of trouble, then they both discuss the second advent. But the core chapter that we focus on to see the difference in these histories is this one here. The sins of Babylon is the parallel chapter to liberty of conscience threatened, which is repeated in the next two chapters, the impending conflict, the scriptures a safeguard. So this is the issue of the Sunday law history. We understand the breaking of the Protestant horn. If Christ is going to return in either of these histories, what needs to be broken? The Republican horn. So there needs to be actions by the United States that breaks that Republican horn. Here in the great controversy chapters, we're so familiar with them. Adventists who don't understand or accept 1989, the beginning of this third and final history of success, the history of the 144,000, the last hook they have to hang their faith on is 1888. So they go back to the great controversy and they read this version to understand the Sunday law history. And you should no more do refer to that version than you should refer to this version. Both must be looked upon as histories of failure. Where God has given his people, despite what he sees, the message they need to say, I will return in your history, but that is a conditional prophecy. They had to be prepared for him. They had to do the work. Both times, Millerite history, 1888 history, it's God's people that failed. Both times, there was a delay out of mercy. Ellen White says in the Great Controversy, in the movements now in progress in the United States will come the Sunday Law. Those movements then in progress are not happening today. They came to an end. The National Reform Association ceased to operate. So these movements did not lead to the Sunday Law crisis spoken of in the Great Controversy. And by 1900... By 1900, she's already said again in Evangelism 694, that if God's people had have been fa faithful, ere this, Christ would have returned. So by 1900, she's saying he should have returned, there's been a delay. So they're given spiritual gifts. God's people fail, they go into later Sionism. She says there's been a delay out of mercy because of the failure of God's people. You come into 1888 history, they're given the great controversy. By 1900, she's saying there's been a delay. This has not, uh, the plan of God for him to return in either history has not come to fruition. We must combine both to understand our own history. So when we go back and we look at the history of the Millerites and we focus on 1798 to 1863, what we are doing is looking at the failed alpha history of modern Israel. It's the triple application. You take spiritual gifts history, that plan, plus the great controversy history, that plan to understand our own history of the 144,000. One plus two equals the third. That's why you don't have a detailed description of the third woe in the book of Revelation. The first woe plus the second woe explains to us the third woe. So that's just a, a quick look on how we understand the Sunday law today. If we want to know what that way mark is, we have to take both histories and apply parable methodology. Understanding that that chapter, the sins of Babylon, is just as much telling us about the way mark of the breaking of the Republican horn, that 34 AD Sunday law way mark, 
as is any chapter in the Great Controversy. And then once we explain that, we go into detail about what that chapter of early writings, its spiritual gifts, the sins of Babylon teaches. And that entire chapter is explaining the sin of the United States. She's referring when she says Babylon to the institutions of the United States. And she's talking about the sin of the institution of the United States. And what is that? What was the sin of the, those institutions in the 1850s, particularly marked in 1850 itself? It was the sin of slavery. You go through that chapter and it becomes so clear the import that she is putting on the issue of slavery. What she is saying, if you go particularly to the end, it, I like the fact that that chapter the Sins of Babylon, it's early writings, page 273. It all takes us back full circle, back to Acts 27. Acts 27 opens up the 2019-2021, the, the increase of knowledge, the formalization of our understanding of the Sunday law. It shows us the shipwreck, the, um, the fall of the institutions of the United States and Adventism. Acts 27 gave us that view of the Sunday law. Then it brought us to 273, which brought us to the king of the north, the king of the south, which brought us to equality, which brought us back around to spiritual gifts, which brought us back to 273, which brings us back to Acts 27. The, the whole study is like a, a picture perfect puzzle. It brings us back around with the perfect consistency that God's inspiration always does. You go into beginning with early writings, page 273, that chapter, and she speaks about the United States as having filled the cup, the cup referred to in Revelation chapter 18. Revelation 18 brings us to the Sunday law. And she says that the United States filled that cup you can link it to 1850. So that way mark, everything that you would expect to be fulfilled by that way mark, by the angel of Revelation 18, can, can be locked solid on top of 1850, which would have meant that there would have been a, a perfect prophetic model in Millerite history, if Christ had have come back in 1863, you would have seen the, all that fulfillment, the breaking of the lamb-like horns, the turning of the United States from speaking like a lamb to speaking like a, a dragon. Finally, it's judgment and fall under the civil war that was then in progress. So I won't go further into 1850 because as we step through Millerite history, we're going to discuss Millerite history again. So I'll rub out these references if you don't mind. So we began to approach this um, we began to approach this subject of the Alpha of Modern Israel pretty much from the beginning of this series, but we didn't really focus in intensely on the beginning uh, uh, on just Millerite, just 1798 to 1863. What we did was we went over, we had an overarching look at Protestantism from the First Great Awakening through the Second um, and the, the uh, history of 1798, which occurred within the Second Great Awakening. So I just want to remind us of what we discussed there. <coughs> 
we just really did an overarching line and we showed how in 1798 there's, the, there's these two branches of Protestantism. It, it's a split that developed in Protestantism from early on, particularly you could pin it actually from the first great awakening between those who were wishing to, um, I suppose, to uh, move forward, take in new light, change some old treasured beliefs, um, being Protestantism, th that there was positives and negatives of that. But then you had this staunchly uh, fundamentalist branch of Protestantism, particularly that held to Calvinism and had no intention of changing from those core fundamental, essentially conservative, conserve, uh, to conserve those conservative beliefs. And we marked the two branches in 1798 because it's in 1798 you see them split over a US election. And that conservative branch was particularly led by Jedediah Morse. Jedediah Morse supported John Adams in his re-election, but then you had this uh, liberal branch that didn't support John Ab uh, uh, Adams, and they were supporting who? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is the one that gives us the phrase, the wall of separation between church and state. So you had the conservatives under Jedediah Morse, who were opposed to such a separation, who were opposed to change, and who introduced in 1798 the conspiracy theories into the American political discourse, particularly the idea of a Bavarian Illuminati operating within a US deep state. And we spent presentation after presentation showing how that conservative Protestant model using conspiracy theories opposed to globalism that's heavily nationalistic, that believes in deep state and satanic cults, how that became absorbed into Adventism. And we discussed that when we discussed, compared and contrasted ancient Israel and modern Israel. Ancient Israel held onto the Apis bull, how that occurred through their three histories, captivity to Egypt, captivity to, to Rome, sorry, Egypt, Rome, Babylon, and then for modern Israel, Millerite history, 1888, our own history. The three histories of ancient Israel, the three histories of modern Israel, both holding on to idolatry. Ancient Israel, the idolatry of pagan nations, which can be symbolized by the Apis bull, Modern Israel, the idolatry of Protestantism. What we have to clearly understand is which branch of Protestantism we've absorbed our idolatry from. Is it the idolatry of this socially liberal Protestantism that is not opposed to globalism, that is not nationalistic, or is it this socially conservative branch of Protestantism that absorbs conspiracy theories? uses conspiracy theories to argue, um, to, to become involved in US politics, that talks of a deep state that forms a church state union. Which branch has Adventism um, taken in the idolatry of? And we showed through working through all that history right down to um, the, the, the woman in the, in the 18... 60s and 70s, uh, what was her name? Someone remembers, put it in, in the chat. <coughs> Spot quiz when I can't remember. No pressure. Her type of thinking as it was absorbed into Adventism particularly finds its greatest revelation. Mary Stuart Ralph, thank you Sister Lily. Mary Ralph, that mindset that was absorbed through conservative Protestantism that has its, it is most exhibited in Adventism itself through the type of teaching of Walter Weith. 
and the penchant that Adventists have for conspiracy theories, for belief in the deep state. So I won't review all of that. I'm just reminding us of what we've done. This is all preparation to go back into Millerite history. So we discussed 1798, 1850, history of 1888, 1919, 1960s, and then I'll put 2016. I'm not trying to be precise in my dates. What I'm trying to demonstrate is that there is certain points in history that act like a litmus test and they will show you this division clearly between these two split branches of Protestantism. One of the earliest was 1850s, 18, I should say 1840s and 1850s. The subject of slavery. Slavery so neatly, literally split Protestantism in two. The three largest Protestant denominations in the United States experienced schisms between 1843 and 1845, particularly centering on the year 1844. So the, the, the division within Protestantism there was very visible, very literal, but it's as real today as it was then. It's not quite so literal, so literally visible, but the division is just as much evidenced today. So there's been litmus tests through history that show these two sides. Slavery was one of them. Not all Protestants supported slavery. Jedediah Morse, his son, uh, invented the Morse code. And what was his position on slavery? Completely pro-slavery, pro the South, because he learnt from his father. This one, we haven't discussed much the two branches of Protestantism in the issue of blue laws in the United States. Some homework, if you're willing, look into these two branches and try to understand whether or not there were Protestants opposing those Sunday laws. Which branch, which of these two branches, where did they stand on those 1888 Sunday law issues? Nine, what happened in the history of 1919 that showed the split? Spot quiz. What happened here that showed the two divisions in Protestantism? The fundamentalists were at work. What had just happened in 1919? You have World War I, and what do they want to do to prevent another world war? They wanted to form the League of Nations. So, yes, so they want to form the League of Nations, and that split Protestantism between, uh, that they weren't called conservative or liberal, it wasn't phrased that way. And they've changed name over time. The reason that we have the name evangelical today, one of the reasons is in trying to distance themselves from the type of Christianity spoken of by Adolf Hitler in World War II. So that they, there's been different names over time for different groups. These are essentially the, the fundamentalists. And the fundamentalists in 1919 are completely opposed to the League of Nations because of the worldview they've developed around both the nationalism and the conspiracy theories of Jedediah Morse. So this was another litmus test, the League of Nations, those who support nationalism and those who were supporting globalism. Again, the idolatry of Adventism does not come from globalism. It comes from the threat of nationalism. And we drew up in the board through those presentations the, the, the fact we all believe in a one world government, but what that looks like takes you down two different channels, two different streams. 
where you either say Trump is the hero or Trump is the villain. 18, 1960s, how were they split? Civil rights movement. 2016, Donald Trump. And you see that split as alive today as it was in Millerite history. So we had this overarching view of what Protestantism was doing. Uh, this is, um, I'm sure, oversimplified and far too brief, but it gives us some picture of this internal fight within Protestantism that becomes visible through these litmus test issues. So what we want to do is we want to cut our line. We want to cut it in 1863 and we want to focus on the alpha history of modern Israel. So we're going to close now. We'll close now. What we'll do when we'll come back next week is we want to start constructing that reform line, 1798 to 1863. We want to do to that history what we have done to the end of ancient Israel. Uh, the this, the um, picture that I shared, screen shared with you earlier, the end of ancient Israel. We want to do the same thing that we did there with the beginning of modern Israel. Uh, we want to see both the internal dynamics of that history and also connected to the internal events, we want to see the external events of that reform line. So we'll close now for time. What we have tried to do is revise, uh, we, we revised how we come to, uh, we revised how the King of the North, the King of the South, study developed into equality. Then we went back to reviewed end of ancient Israel, so it's in our minds, the three groups called, then the 144,000. We came back to the question asked about uh, the, the return of Christ in 1863. We went to spiritual gifts and the great controversy to demonstrate that, reinforced with quotes from those histories that illustrate what the original plans of God were for the people living then. Then we reviewed how we have gone over uh, what we've been doing up till now in trying to show the experience of Protestant in, Protestantism in uh, the last, the, the, pretty much from the original time of the end, from 1798, from Daniel 11 verse 40. What happens within Protestantism? To close, I'll remind us of how that message was developed. How did we say it was developed? to understand all these things. Acts 27 showed us the break of uh, the fall of the institutions of Adventism in the United States at the Sunday Law, the shipwreck. Through the 273 it took us to Pyrrhus, the king of the south, to understanding the world wars, the king of the north, the king of the south. That took us next, uh, next step to understanding equality. Equality took us where? Equality t takes us back to 1850s, spiritual gifts, God's original plan, our alpha history. Spiritual gifts takes us back around to 273 Acts 27, showing us what shipwreck was originally meant to look like. So I will close now and when we come back next, next Sabbath, we're going to essentially ignore this part of um, history for the moment. Uh, we won't make application, so we won't go into our own for, for that presentation. We'll discuss 1888 at a future time 
What we want to do is see the external and the internal events of 1798 to 1863, the Alpha history that was meant to witness the second advent of Christ. If you kneel with me, we will close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you for your goodness towards us and for how you uh, teach us like little children. You open up information to us piece by piece. It doesn't come in, in, in an over, overwhelming amount, but you know what we can each handle and absorb. I pray, Lord, we will not be afraid of the information that we still are struggling to understand, that we might have such faith in your leading, in your leading in our past history, that in our darkest moments we will not be shaken to let go of those cords. May we be established in these things. I pray, Lord, that as you continue to open up light to your movement, to your people, that we will not, uh, that as we see things taught in the past are more complex as we advance in grades, that we will not be afraid to revisit what we have previously understood. May we not see this as past error, but at how you have led us so gently. Thank you for our blessings, Lord, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.